what I loved about the album experience was when you when you heard an album that you loved, you might listen to it ten times the first day and nine times the second day, and in the course of two weeks, I, I would describe it like you were injecting it into your bloodstream. Yes. So after a couple of weeks, it was now part of you. Yeah, this immersion therapy. It was right. indeed it was it was indeed immersion therapy, and and so by the end of a couple of weeks, I had not only become immersed in Bruce's albums, but by continuing to listen to that live show, I realized, wow, this guy is something else. I can't wait to see him in concert. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson, and I have one of my literary idols. I will wow. em- I will embarrass him. I have a Peabody and WGAW award-winning writer, director, producer, David Leaf. David, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jesse. It's 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 great to be with you. Uh, you know, right at this moment, I wish I was somewhere in the New York metropolitan area, with the with the Yankee game on television and a, a good New York pie in front of me. But uh, this is the next best thing. If you need to recancel so you can watch the Yankees, I'm okay with it. The Yanks the Yanks will do fine whether I'm watching or not. Maybe <laughs> okay. maybe maybe I'm a jinx. So <laughs> that's good. David Leaf is a writer. He has was the instigator an All Star tribute to Brian Wilson. Uh, one of my favorite documentaries, "Beautiful Dreamer." Brian Wilson, the story of Smile. I just had a guy join me who does rock documentary podcast, and I asked him, "Has he done Beautiful Dreamer yet?" And he goes, "No." I said, "Okay, sign me up. Let's join. Me. Let me be your guest, and we can discuss that." U.S. is John Lennon, just tons of stuff. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping to visit a little bit of everything, but I do have to tell my listeners, um, you were just recently on Ken Levine's wonderful podcast, and you did a great story about Brian Wilson, and you have an updated book. And so we're going to talk about that in our next episode. We're going to split this in two parts. I found your website, sent you an email, and I swear quicker than you can ever expect david sent an email back saying i love bruce springsteen absolutely i'll be on your podcast so that is good to hear why don't you tell us a little about yourself well i grew up i was born in in new york city in manhattan uh grew up in uh, westchester county went to nourishell high school um after being uh, asked to leave uh, horace mann school for boys um and uh, moved to California in, in 1975, um, in, in part because uh, I wanted to write a book about Brian Wilson. Um, but I was, I was a rock and roll nut uh, from the time I was about six years old. I remember going to the store with my older brother and buying Come Go With Me by the Dell Vikings. Um, and I remember every week, always had part-time jobs, and so every week I'd go to the record store and I could buy one forty-five, and um, you know it was it was always a big decision. Um, so I was a singles guy. I was a radio guy. I was a top forty guy in, in the sixties. Um, we didn't have a stereo till you know close to the end of the decade. Didn't really buy albums, um, with the exception of uh, the Beatles and uh, Neil Sedaka's greatest hits. Uh, I was I was a sports guy. Uh, I was on my way to being a sports writer and a sports caster. I worked for the local newspaper, worked uh, uh, for a television station on Long Island as as a sports caster. I actually got to interview Mickey Mantle um, on Old Timers Day, 
appropriate to, to mention today because today is the mixed uh, birthday. I loved that when we were discussing when we could talk, uh, you said, well, let's pick Mickey Mantle's birthday. That'll be a lucky uh, sign. <laughs> so I, I love that. Uh, and and so I, I was really, you know, headed for a career in sports. A couple, a couple of things derailed it. Um, one was eventually I realized I, I didn't quite know what I was talking about. That loving sports and being a, a sports writer and a, and a really great, great one, being a great sportscaster, required a, a in-depth knowledge of the game. And I have a good knowledge of the game, but, but I didn't feel like it was good enough. But the, but the thing that really uh, sent me off in a different direction was music. Because music was my religion, if you will. And so when I found out you could write about music um, in college, um, and I became the music editor of, of, of the college newspaper, um, it was like, oh, my God, not only do you get to write about music, but they send you lots of free albums. Like this peanut butter and chocolate moment, right? Like, oh, I can put music and love writing. Yeah, that's and great. Indeed. And and um, as we're talking about uh, Mr. Springsteen at this moment, I thought I'll, I'll begin my Bruce journey with as an embarrassing a moment as one could ever confess okay. on the Springsteen podcast. I opened the envelope with uh, from Columbia with greetings from Asbury Park. And in it was the usual, the next Dylan kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I remember where I was standing in my dorm room and I put the needle on side one and I listened for about 30 seconds or so and said, picked up the needle and, and said to myself, yep, he's like Dylan. He can't sing either. <laughs> and that's a pretty stupid thing to have said and done, but that was my first encounter with the boss. I wanted to go back growing up. Was there a lot of music in your family? Um, we are similar to a generation. I was born in 59. So just a few years after you where, you know, I grew up on an AM radio, a clock radio, and that was my music. Right. So how about you? Did your parents listen to a lot of music? Um, my parents went to a lot of Broadway shows oh. and they listened to middle of the road music. Okay. So on television, anyone who could carry a tune and had a pleasant face had a show, yes. Perry Como, et cetera. So that, there was a lot of that. Um, we watched a show called Sing Along with Mitch. I don't remember watching it, but I'm familiar with the show, right? Um, Mitch Miller was kind of the enemy of rock and roll at Columbia, whereas John Hammond was a musician's best friend. Obviously, yeah. the guy who signed not just Dylan, but uh, Bruce. Anyway, Aretha Franklin. Um, so I, I remember they just saw that, uh, you know, and he said, we didn't know what we were, we didn't know what we were doing with you, Aretha. So, yeah. that That's right. In fact, I'm, I'm uh, in post-production on a documentary on Dion. Yes, I'm looking forward to seeing that. And um, and, and Dion talked about a scene where, where he and Aretha are at the piano outside John Hammond's office singing. And John Hammond comes out and says to Dion, you got to come down to the studio. There's this guy I want you to see. We just signed him. And it's Bob Dylan. What Dion has to say about Dylan is staggering. And of course, Dylan is a massive... Dion fan um, without getting too sidetracked for the for the Dion documentary I've interviewed both uh, Bruce and uh, and little Steven oh nice because, because Dion is really the, the 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 voice of New York rock and roll that to the first one to, to emerge and and so everybody comes in his footsteps uh, anyway so there was there was a lot of pop music Okay. Uh, but but we had the transistor radio with the earphone, fell asleep more often than not with the radio going and woke up to a dead battery battery in the radio. Um, <clears throat> bought my singles, and it really wasn't until the Beatles that albums 
became part of my life, but only Beatle albums. Okay. There wasn't anything else I was going to buy uh, as an LP. And that didn't change till I got to college. Um, and living in the dorm where I went, where I went to school, there was, I don't know, say there was 14 dorm rooms on the floor. Right. You could go from room to room and everybody had a carton full of albums and you would flip through them. And it was like you could get an education because everybody had different tastes. Um, and within six months, I probably heard 20 new artists who I fell in love with. Not that they were new, but they were new to me. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, David. And, and so my ears were opened in, in a way that they, they hadn't been. Um, and, and music became, you know, my grand, my grand passion, my grand obsession. Um, and, and I was, it was the, you know, the era of the singer songwriter. So James Taylor's first album on Apple was a gigantic record for me. Um, I, I saw him at Carnegie Hall and, um, he introduced his piano player by saying, uh, she wrote a bunch of songs back in the sixties. You might remember, um, like up on the roof and will you still love me tomorrow? Say hello to Carol King wide applause and she proceeded to sing a few of her classics this was pre-tapestry yeah so so i went to see Joni mitchell in concert and jackson brown was the opening act i saw paul simon on his first solo tour um saw tom waits i mean i just saw a tremendous amount of singer songwriter was was what appealed to me i was i really wasn't a rock and roller right i, mean, I loved i loved the who um, but I wasn't the kind of person who was going to, you know, have have Led Zeppelin blaring in, in my in my headphones. Um, and uh, when I heard about Bruce, you ready? Are we ready to go down? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, yeah, that so you 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 get greetings. You go, nope, can't sing. Moving on. When um, did you go back and visit again? So, so of course, what happens is, you know, Blinded by the Light and Spirit of the Night are both giant radio hits, which I hear and love. And oh, this Bruce Springsteen guy writes great songs. I, you know, hadn't really thought about it. And I remember, and, and you probably know the exact date, but there was a broadcast from the bottom line in 1974, pre-born pre to run. Right. And um, I was a big taper. I had a, a, an Advent tape deck. I taped everything off WNEW FM or, or WPLJ. And, and um, I had a, a, a small Sony uh, 55 that I would take to whatever concerts I went to and tape those. It's like I wanted to capture my experience to relive, mm -hmm. um, even if the fidelity wasn't great. And I taped that, that Springsteen at the Bottom Line show. And it didn't connect with me instantly. But when I moved to California, it, it was the tape that I played in the car all the time, back in the days when we had cassette decks in the yes, car. Yes, indeed, yes. And that show was like, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It was like, oh my God. So now it's time for me to buy a Bruce Springsteen album. So I get Wild and Innocent. I, I get greetings and now I'm waiting for Born to Run and here it comes. And of course, um, I was late to the game, although I guess here we are in 2022 talking about Bruce. So I wasn't that late yeah, to the exactly. game. Exactly. But um that was, you know, what I what I loved about the album experience was when you when you heard an album that you loved, you might listen to it 10 times the first day and nine times the second day. And in the course of two weeks, I, I would describe it like you were injecting it into your bloodstream. Yes. So after a couple of weeks, it was now part of you. Yeah, this immersion therapy. It was right. indeed it was it was indeed immersion therapy. And and so by the end of a couple of weeks, I had not only become immersed in Bruce's albums, but by continuing to listen to that live show, 
I realized, wow, this guy is something else. I can't wait to see him in concert. So I, I'm going to muddy the water just a little bit. Um, when we talk about Brian and the Beach Boys, I'll tell you my Beach Boy origin story. But at 77, I had, they were my first musical obsession. Um, okay. And so when I bought Born to Run, Racing in the Street felt to me like, hey, his version of a Beach Boy song, you know, <laughs> instead of, you know, uh, you know, 409 or you know uh it it, it felt funny. like it right um i i never made that connection never never made that connection at all because bruce's lyrics were always so deep they yes. were saying something absolutely it, it wasn't like she's real fine my 409 exactly this, this there, there, there was a story in this in yeah, every it, one of those songs an adult version of yeah, of of a Beach Boy car song. And so, yeah. So um, you shared with me, and, and I need you to tell the story about you spending the night getting tickets, and you are convinced you're on a bootleg. So please tell that story. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a number, there's a number of, of, of stops there. Okay, so, please. So, so I lived on the west side of Los Angeles. I still do. And there's a there's a there's an auditorium called the Santa Monica Civic. And every Sunday we would read the calendar section of the LA Times because that's where the concert announcements would be. And there it is, Bruce Springsteen is coming to the Santa Monica Santa Monica Civic for two shows. To give the the listener some perspective, the Santa Monica Civic is where the Tammy show was filmed okay. back in 1964. So it's a historic venue. Not really a necessarily a, a concert venue. It's where they would have the annual stamp and coin show. Okay. <laughs> I mean, but this is where he's going to be, and tickets are going to go on sale the, the Tuesday after Labor Day weekend. And uh, a, a friend of mine from college who was living in L.A. and I would had we had together become giant Springsteen fans driving around Los Angeles, listening to the boss. And we like, we got to go. We got to get great seats. So we slept outside the box office, not one night, but the entire Labor Day weekend, Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night. You guys there were, were only, not going to There were to only be. six of us. And including a guy named Harvey Kubernick, who I met, who was, who was at that point the LA correspondent for Melody, Mag Melody Maker Magazine. So um, it's, it's how I met Harvey and Harvey is one of the great LA music historians and rock historians in general. Anyway, we bought tickets for both shows. Much to my disappointment, and I didn't quite understand it, um, being that we were you know that early to buy tickets, our seats were in the second row. We also bought tickets for Bruce was going from Santa Monica up to Santa Barbara to play at the Santa Barbara Ball. So we we're going to see him three times, probably in four nights. And the night of the show, we we get to the Santa Monica Civic and, you know, as excited. <clears throat> I, I would say the only time I was more excited for a concert was earlier in the year was when I saw McCartney for the first time at the L.A. Forum. Um, uh, this this was a going to be a big deal. I, mean, I had seen Elton John a bunch of times, the Moody Blues. I went to see George Harrison. I was at the Elton John concert the night John Lennon came out on stage the last time in front of a of a concert audience. So I saw some pretty great shows, um, but this was going to be it. We had listened to you know, Bruce live at the Roxy, live at the Bottom Line. I had started going to swap meets and buying the bootlegs. So we we were immersed. Yes. And we get into the into the arena, we go to our seats, and much to our uh, surprise, disappointment, dismay, and youthful anger, there are 15 rows of seats in front of us, as well as a aisle. Well, what's happened is I asked somebody, hey, so wait a second, I bought second row seats. The 
stage that Bruce needed didn't go out that far. So then actually the night of the show, if you showed up without tickets, you got the seats in those first 15 rows. And I was, you know, as angry as a, as a 24 year old. King. Yes, I can imagine. And, and um, to add to that, when he went into the audience during um, what song was he going into the crowd for at, at that point? Uh, uh, Spirit in the night or. Yeah, yeah probably. Um, he was playing to the people in those rows and I'm sitting there going like, wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. We're the, we're the ones who, who, but it was like thinking these are the, these are the, right. the, the most I hardcore heard. devoted fans. Anyway, time passes and those remain two of the great concerts I've ever seen. The Santa Barbara show was great, but having seen the, the Santa Monica civic shows, you say, well, okay, so it's kind of the same. It really wasn't all that different, but it was it was still great. Yeah, I, I think um the the lore has come and mm -hmm. uh, you know over the years about how often he changes his set list. And there's a little bit of myth in that, that there is sometimes I mean, you know, he he has blocks. But yes, in the earlier times, they were, you know, that you have a set list that works and you're going, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. He, he, I, I don't remember whether they were identical or not. Yeah, it did. It didn't matter. Right. It was. It was. We were yelling Bruce at the top of our lungs. Yes. Um, have you remained a fan? I've remained a fan. I mean, the the next time he came to Los Angeles, okay, he played the he played the forum. All right. Um, we had good seats. And this same Harvey Kubernick guy who I had remained in touch with who was very helpful in, in the research for, for the Beach Boys and the California myth, right. which I was wor working on in 1977, 78. Um, he came over to me at intermission and he said, don't stay for the encore. Get in your car and go to the go to the bot go to the bottom line, go to the Roxy and get online. He's going to play a show at the Roxy. Wow. I was like, oh, my God. So we we left um, at at, at, uh, before the encores, raced to West Hollywood, found a place to park a car, got online. We were at that point, maybe there were 35 or so people ahead of us. And we were when they finally opened the box office the next day, we were just about the last people in line to get tickets for the show, which was famous as a radio broadcaster, right. radio broadcast. And it's the one that begins with Bruce going, bootleggers, roll your tape. <laughs> and it was now I'm seeing him in, in the great environment. I, I wasn't smart enough to go to the bottom line or the Roxy the first time around, or was it the Agora? The Agora? Was that the place he played in Cleveland that was famous? I think so. Yeah. Um, and what did I? What song did I want to hear that he, I had never heard him play live before? Well, by this point, Darkness was out, and I'm screaming for Candy's Room, and I'm the only one screaming for Candy's Room, <laughs> and he played Candy's Room. Yeah, so I will take I will take credit for that. Good. Uh, when you interviewed him, did you tell him that story? You know, I don't think I had time to. Okay. I, yeah. I might have told, I don't think I had time to tell him the whole story. I might okay. have told it to him really quickly. That's fine. I, I had 20 minutes to interview yeah. him. Yeah. That's, was, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, Darkness was a, a great album. It, it was similar in kind of tone and texture to, to, to Born to Run. So it wasn't the same revelation, but it, it was like, okay. Yeah. It's, it's it's almost there. Great, great songs on it. Um, and and then couple, you asked me if I remained a fan. So yeah. ne next time around, it's The River. Right. Yes. And it's a two album set. And for whatever reason, that was when he started playing at, at, a, at this horrible old arena called the L.A. Sports Arena. All right. Terrible sound, terrible sight lines. But of course, we went. Uh, multiple times if we if he didn't i don't remember how many shows he played there um 
but we, I was, I remained a devoted fan. The, the river, what was upsetting about the river was not the album. And correct me if I've got my history wrong. Which album was this? The album that had "Hungry Heart" on it. Yes. Okay. I had been telling my friends about Springsteen and how great he was, and what a great songwriter he was, and how meaningful his lyrics were. And when "Hungry Heart" became a radio hit, my friends are like, "This is the guy you've been telling us about." Yeah. I mean, it was, it was like it was almost embarrassing. Everybody's got a hungry heart. Everybody's got a hungry heart. It's like. No, that's not the guy. That's yeah, but he's become successful, right? That's that's wonderful. Um, the river for us fans who now had four albums behind us seemed a, seemed a little bit too much, right? Uh, it was a little more difficult to absorb all at once. Um, it it had a lot of great stuff on it for sure. So so we'll skip Nebraska. So when born in USA <laughs> came, no, no, just because uh, you're, I, I love Nebraska and everyone does, but if you're feeling that way about the river, when born in the USA and the world discovers him, I mean, I know there are fans that, and it's a mixed emotion, right? You want this artist you love to have success, but it also, you kind of, I've lost him or her, you know, I've had this, connection i was in the secret club and right. now that everyone is open well the way i'll compare it, there's a wonderful documentary um called good old frida who's the Be the beatles fan club president in liverpool okay and the fans in liverpool who were going to the cavern when the, when the beatles had their first hit with love me do they realized that it was over for them and it, it was sad um, because they realized, like what you're saying, they've now lost them them to uh, an, another place, the world. Yeah. They're no longer ours. They're everybody's. Yes. And that was difficult. Now, you mentioned that everybody loved Nebraska. I can't say that I love Nebraska. Right. Because it wasn't what I was expecting or what I wanted. Right. I, respect, I respected it. Um. And, uh, and you know, just thinking about, uh, you know, yeah. I, I liked it. Like, I know I liked Atlantic City and Mansion on the Hill, uh, my father's house and reason to believe. But but overall, I would say that would, you know, be my least played Bruce Springsteen album. Yeah, we um, just. Uh, yeah, I just did an episode with um, a guest and he talked about that exploring Nebraska now that there's been Broadway and now that Bruce did his autobiography, you know what place he was at, where he was fighting his demons and the depression, which gives it a fresh perspective. So yes, yeah. I I mean, I I was a casual fan. I, I remember buying uh, The River and um, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, had a friend, Lisa Mesh, who went to school in the East coast and she came back talking about this guy, Bruce Springsteen. Um, so I remember buying the river. I don't even, don't even remember Nebraska coming out though. I remember the story when they were doing a story on MTV and videos, they said, and some artists don't even appear. And they mentioned Springsteen doing Atlanta city. And then like everyone else, you know, born in USA, the world knew about Bruce then. Right. Yeah. And, and and that that was fine because I I was growing up, I right. was having my I was building my career, I was I was working, and so it was like a tip of the hat. And and so okay, he's 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 a star, even though goodness knows Born in the USA had to be one of the most in, misinterpreted songs of all time. Absolutely. Um what was really difficult for for us older fans was um, what happened next with, with the E Street Band. Yes, uh, being I don't know what the word for it, but they were no longer there. Yeah, and and, and so that that was really tough. I am always fascinated by that dark period, and so you know, what were your feelings when 
you know, Bruce has moved to California. He's fired the East Street Band. You know, I, I, I think betrayal may be too long, a hard of a word, but people, they, they felt like, oh no, this is, this was our guy. How can you, how can you break up the band? Well, it, it, when you think of the picture uh, on the cover of Born to Run with with Ian Clarence, yes, it, it's like it's like they got a divorce. Yes, and okay, who do we go with? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's and we, we went with Bruce, right? Um, but that didn't mean it wasn't a broken home. Yeah, and and so the, the following years were difficult. Um, Tunnel of Love, Human Touch, Lucky Town. I, I still went to see him in concert, but it, it, it wasn't the same. When it, you, you it, did go it, see the other band and it yes. it was it was just a little different, right? It it was different. It felt different. Of course, the song selection was very different. And and there was, you know, there there wasn't uh you know, the guys aren't there. Yeah. So it was it was it, it was hard to understand. Um it was, you know, it was like going to, you know, Paul McCartney's on stage, but there are no other Beatles. Right. You know, that, that you know, it's it's not quite the same as yeah, that. Yeah, but I but, know what you're saying. But so, so it was, I was, I remained a fan to this day. Um, you know, I, 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 I was one of the writers on the, uh, the, the tribute to heroes, the, okay. the 9-11 uh, telethon. Right. Amer America tribute to heroes. And I remember the conversation of how the show was going to begin. And I was in a minority of one because everybody wanted to, to open with Bruce and my city and rooms. And, and um, I wanted to open with Stevie Wonder. Um, my, I'm sorry, my city of rooms. I wanted to open with Stevie Wonder with Love's in Need of Love Today because <clears throat> I, I, I thought Stevie singing, good morning or evening friends. Here's your friendly announcer. I've got serious news to share. I thought that, that was the way to open a show. Um, I was outvoted. Um, I thought Stevie's song would be more inclusive to the world, whereas Bruce's spoke from a New Yorker, or, well, a New Jersey guy, but a New Yorker to yeah. a New Yorker, which, you know, it worked. I was going to say, after the fact, what? How did you feel? It's I, a safe know, space, I, David. I, 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 <laughs> I, I don't know that I thought much about it other than telling that story. Yeah. I mean, the highlight of the night for me, because um, everyone on that show uh, was it was a was what we'll call an American, right? And mostly white Americans. Right. Um, Tom Hanks, Kelsey Grammer, Jim Carrey, Robin Williams. Yeah. Um, there were some people of color, Jimmy, Jimmy Smits, Lucy Liu, um, Will, Will Smith. Um, great stories working with George Clooney, the, 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 the nicest guy you could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but the highlight moment for me was... Um, Muhammad Ali is on the program. So if we want to talk about who our heroes are in life, um, in 1964, in February of 1964, the Beatles are on the Ed Sullivan Show and a man named Cassius Clay wins the heavyweight championship and changes his name to Muhammad Ali and becomes an instant enemy of white America and then the, the United States government in, in the most heroic way by re refusing induction into the armed services, even though it cost him the prime of his career. Now, we all knew that at that point he had Parkinson's. We Nobody knew how bad it was. Would he be able to talk? So I remember standing next to him, which, God, why weren't there cell phones with cameras on yes. then? Um, and he's there with Will Smith, who had just played Ali in, in the movie. And I handed the champ, we call Bruce the boss, Ali is the champ. Yes. And it was a very short speech because we didn't want him to have to make a long speech. 
And he looked at it and he kind of nodded his head. And then when they went out, we didn't know what he was going to actually do. And when he got out there, he spoke off the top of his head from the heart. And as, as heroic a moment as he ever had, maybe his last great heroic moment on, on, on a big public stage. And, and it, it was magnificent. It's worth tracking down that clip to see because it, 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 you know, that I get goosebumps thinking about that. Yeah. How did you get involved with writing the, that special? So um, I'm friends with a guy named David Wilde, who's a, you know, kind of a legendary Rolling Stone writer. And, and, yeah. and he, I think he wrote the Grammys for 35 or 40 years. I mean, just, he's been part of music television forever. And he called me because I've been, I've been, I've been writing um, television for a long time. Um, I was on an, I wrote an Elvis Presley tribute, all sorts of variety programs. Mm -hmm. So I was known, I was known, I had written the Billboard Awards for a, a decade. So I was known as somebody who wrote that kind of uh, television. Yeah. And so he called me and he says, would you like to do it? And it was like, what are you kidding? Sure. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been in California for since 1975, but I'm still in New York. Yeah in in my in my in my soul and and so um it it was a thrill to be part of that and, and in some small way contribute to i mean nothing can ease the loss and pain of those who died um the, the heroic first responders the people in the buildings I and mean, there's there's nothing there's no words that can salve that so but, but, but it yeah. was a, a thrill. It was a thrill to be part of it. So, I knew I was going to tell you some stories about um, your work um, affecting me and and touching me, and and we will get to these stories. But what's hilarious is I had not counted on this. So I was a casual Springsteen fan, right? Bought the box set, you know, um, listened to it a little bit, um, then you know had the kid career everything's kind of going on um and the 9-11 happened and the tribute and this it opens and bruce doing that song went oh wait what is this oh my goodness which led to buying the rising and the first time i saw bruce live was during a rising tour 2002 so <laughs> that did even though you voted you know, you were the uh, lone dissenting, you know, the loyal opposition. That was a absolutely pivotal moment in my Springsteen fandom. That's great. That, yeah. That's, a, that's, that's, you know, that, that's one of the great things about music. Yeah. Is it doesn't matter when you come to it, but when yeah. it hits you like a sledgehammer, yeah. it's, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Absolutely. Um, so did you make it to Broadway? I did make it to Broadway. Absolutely. Nice. And and loved loved every minute of it as as, as expensive as it was. <laughs> it was expensive. Did what are your thoughts? Are you able to separate, you know, you're a fan, but you're also you're a professional writer. You have written books, his autobiography. You have put on many great, you know, entertainment shows. So is there a difference in how you viewed it, like as a fan eyes and then as a professional's eyes too? Um, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I only had heard that it was great. Yeah. And and I went in as a fan. Okay. I didn't, um, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. I, 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 I don't have any criticism, criticism of it at all. Um, did I did I watch it again on DVD? No. Yeah. Okay. It was it was like one of those experiences that's that's captured in the bottle of the moment. Yeah. That that I don't I don't know. I'm sure it'll be great to watch again someday on a big yeah. screen. But yeah. um, it, it, it that that moment has it hasn't hasn't come. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I was I was really glad to get to it. Yeah, that's good. So, um, any are there? Do you tend to be fans of the older stuff, the original stuff, or are there 
other songs like in the newer that you you have that have spoken to you? I, there are songs that have spoken to me, but it's just it's just it's just not the same. Right. I, mean, I, I, I wrote the liner notes for a CD called Cover Me. Yeah. Which was a collection of Bruce songs that had been re- recorded by others. And I, and I remember I saw Patti Smith at the bottom line. And, uh, you know, Because the Night is as great a song as that Bruce has written. Yeah. I mean, it's just a spectacular song. Yeah. Um, he gave away some good ones. I saw Southside Johnny. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, what we forget, mm-hmm. if, if I can, you know, Please. is... These, these are people. Uh, they have their own dreams. They have their own backstory. They have their own origin story. It's almost impossible to do what Bruce Springsteen did. I mean, it, it, it what was the yeah. first band? The Squires? Was that? The, was that the Castiles, yeah. The Castiles, okay. I was close. Yeah, I had the yeah you were. You were close, anyway. yes. Um, well, no, I there may have been. And well, and who knows? Maybe there was a band squire that I'm not thinking of. No, they're, so, they're probably, yeah. it's probably thinking. You're probably thinking of some other artist. Yeah. Um, but you know, Billy Joel had a band called the Hassles. Okay. Um, the Squires was Neil Young's band. That's, okay. That's, that was almost close. Yeah, um, that's close. So Billy, so Billy Joel fails with his first band. Then he forms a duo, a power duo called Attila. And then he records his first solo album and the mastering is so bad that he moves to California in shame to get away from it yeah. and changes his name. Um, it's impossible to imagine what it's like to put your heart on the line the way these guys do and, and not get anywhere. Yeah. So when it happens, um, it's, what's the word for it? It's so disorienting. It's like getting on the tilt a whirl to yeah. use to to use an Atlantic City ride reference. Yeah. And um, I spent a lot of time working with the Bee Gees through the years. Right. And got to know Barry Gibb pretty well. And he said the most difficult thing to do is survive first fame. I could see that. And so if we look at the period up up through um uh, you know, 1985, 86 yeah. is, is Bruce's first fame, where he marries an actress and all of that. And then he comes out the other side of it. And, okay, I got to put my music, figure out how to way, make my music work again, the way it was working when I was at that peak. And he yeah. does it. It's really difficult. Sure. It, it, touring is, 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 it's a grind. As, as, much energy as he gets from the crowd um it's still really hard work and this isn't a guy i mean when i started going to concerts groups did 25 minute sets right we're talking about three and a half hours right yes i mean you know this this is this man is working yeah working working and you know he he deserves all of the praise and adulation but at the end of the day, he's a, a guy with a wife and a family. Yeah. And he has to navigate the same terrain as everybody else. Yeah. He, 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 the only thing wealth buys you is comfort. Yeah. Physical, you know, the, the surroundings of comfort. But it doesn't buy you psychological comfort. Right. And, and so you have to now deal with the fact that everybody you knew that didn't make it to your level looks at you differently. And that everybody who comes around wants something from you. Is this person sincere or do they have an angle? And it's it's exhausting. And yeah. that's why a, that's why a lot of stars hang around with stars because they're they've all they're all at that level. Yeah. I, I've made the joke when um Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson go out with uh, Bruce and Patty. Like, is there argument on, okay, no, I got this one. No, you pick, you got the last <laughs> one. It's my card this time. You know, the way you would do, like if, if 
if we were going out to dinner, right? Like, oh, no, 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 let's, you know, we'll argue. But if, I think that's funny. So, yeah. Um, but it's, but, but it, they also know that as soon as they walk out of the restaurant, there's going to be paparazzi snapping yes. their pictures. So is, you know, is there a little bit of food in the corner of my teeth yeah. that I got to, I mean, it's, it's, it's that fishbowl that you live in where, where people who've never met you, who don't really know anything about you are dissecting your every move. And of course, you know, in the last, you know, 10, 15 years with the endless chatter on the web about yes. what you did that was good or bad. Yeah. You have, you have to tune it out as an artist. Yeah. You have to block it all out and just do your best. And, so, and, and the yeah. truth is, most people who make popular music do their best work in their 20s into their early 30s. Right. And it's very rare for somebody to do work at that level right. 30 or 40 or 50 years into their career. Yeah, when someone complains that, like, I will see, you know, the internet is a beautiful thing and an ugly thing. And, you know, I'll see someone say... Western stars letter to you. It's nothing compared to darkness, nothing compared to born to run. Well, he, he's already done darkness. He's already done born to run. If he wants to do Western stars, if he wants to do letter to you, if he wants to do a cover of soul songs, let him know. I, I actually, I, I think I'm excited about the, the album of covers. Me too. Because, because songwriters have, a, have a musical palette that they use up melodically yeah. in my opinion I, I you know I, I teach at ucla and i teach a course called songwriters on songwriting and i interview some of the greatest songwriters ever Burt Bacharach, randy newman jimmy webb uh, 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 mike stoller right um barry mann and cynthia weil and and on and on and on and it's they do their best work when they're young and hungry when they have something to prove, it's it's tough to do something. Yeah. So if, if Bruce Bruce wants to revisit the music of his youth that inspired him, yeah. Well, that sounds like a pretty damn good idea to me. That's an album I want to hear. I absolutely do. And to give us a, we're, we're going to talk about Brian Wilson in a little bit, but um, his at my piano, I find amazing. Uh, you know, I I, yeah. I put that in the CD player and it's you're you're like, it's just him playing the piano. And so I've talked to a couple people. Oh, does he sing? No, it's just an instrumental CD, MP3, whatever you want to call it. And it's brilliant. It truly yeah. is something special. Well, you know, it's everything in in, in our fandom is expectation. Right. So when I got it, I was expecting it to be him singing those songs. Right. So the first time I listened, I was kind of scratching my head. The second time I listened to it, I thought it was perfect and brilliant. Because by removing the, the lyrical connotations of, of those songs, what we're hearing is Brian playing his greatest compositions the way he would have played them if he was Bach showing up at the Sunday service to play it for the for the people in the in the uh, in attendance and and Brian who believes that music is the voice of God these songs have a spiritual quality when they're stripped down to their barest form that you can't get anywhere else and and so I I, I love it it's I I and and honestly I I hope it's the last album he does because I think it's a perfect farewell record I, I, I can agree with that. Um, I saw him, um, this last tour and he was opening for Chicago and I was said, I, I think, I think he, I, I, I love him. And we will talk more about my experiences seeing Brian live. I was like, I, I think it's time. I think it's okay. Well, well, you know, the funny thing is if you ask him what he wants to do, or he says, what he wants to do, he says tour. Yeah. And so why does he want a tour? He wants to tour because he loves being around his musicians who are his, it's his musical family. Oh, they are amazing. They, amazing. They play the songs, not just perfect, not just note perfect, but with feeling and heart. Yes. So he's sitting there surrounded by his music 
the way he created it, and the audience is responding to it, and he's feeling all of that. Plus, he likes to order room service. <laughs> yes. So, so, so uh, it, it's 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 interesting. He he doesn't show it on his face anymore when he plays live, but he's taking it in. That's good. That's good. All right. Uh, we are going to switch to Brian in a minute, but um, any other Bruce stories you want to share with me? Any other Bruce stories? Um, I don't think so. I, I think there's okay. one big, big question. you're gonna Yes, ask there me. is. Um, yes. <clears throat> so if you are a fan of David's work and you're listening to this podcast, thank you. Um, I end every podcast with the Mary question. And what that came from is Jay Armstrong is an honors English teacher. He recently retired in the Philadelphia area and his, he would take the song Thunder Road and his senior in their honors English class would break it apart. Look at the themes, talk about the imagery Bruce doing. They'd compare it to Robert Frost, the road not taken. And at the end of the two days, he would ask his class, does Mary get in the car? So David Lee, that is your question. Does Mary get in the car at the end of Thunder Road? Um, so I have, I have two answers, the serious answer and the smartest answer. Perfect. I love them both. Um, they kind of go together. The, the, this, the serious answer is I'm convinced she gets, gets in the car because he's saying it's a town full of losers. I'm pulling out of here a winner. Well, who doesn't want to leave with the guy who's going to be a winner? So that's why I believe that she gets in the car. However, I have a feeling that maybe the second time they stop on the turnpike to uh, get a snack or go to the bathroom, she starts to have second thoughts, and she's thinking, yeah, "I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm ready for this," um, because leaving your the comfort of your universe takes a lot of nerve, and I'm not sure that we've heard anything about Mary that lets me know she's got the ability to go the distance. She has the ability to go, but, right. but can she go the distance? So it's kind of a, kind of a hedge of an answer. No, I think that's an excellent answer. I've had other people say, yes, she gets in the car, but when he stops to buy a pack of cigarettes, she goes, what the hell am I doing? And when he comes out, she's, where'd she go? <laughs> she's so, had a yeah. Greyhound bus going back. Exactly. Yes. Very nice. Cool. Good. Uh, I love that answer. Um, Thank you. Uh, if someone wants to reach you and get more information about your wonderful work, um, how can they? So the, the simplest thing to do is go to my website, website, uh, www.leafprod, L-E-A-F-P-R-O-D.com. Um, there's a, there's a bunch of different pages with news and information and, um, there's a way to contact me on it as well. However, the homepage right now features what's known as the God Only Knows VIP experience in which we're raising money for the Brian Wilson Scholarship Fund at UCLA, which I established uh, four years ago. And so there are different tiers where you can buy a book signed by Brian or uh, it's a limited edition thing. So uh, that, that'll be the homepage for a while and then, then it'll go back to a, a normal homepage. But the, 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 that's one way to reach me. And of course I'm on Facebook, so you can always send me a message. Very nice. All right. Um, listeners, David is going to join me again. We're going to talk Brian Wilson and beach boys, and I'm going to try not to embarrass myself, but you go get vaccinated, go get boosted. Let's all be kind to each other because that's how we're going to get through this. Thank you, David. Thank you listeners. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Doing a podcast at times can be a one-way conversation, and I hate that. So please let me know what you like and don't like about the work I'm doing. You can reach the podcast via email at setlustingbruce at gmail.com. The show is on Twitter, at setlustingbruce, and my personal Twitter is at jessejacksondfw. You can support the podcast by subscribing via your favorite podcast player and leaving us a review. The more reviews we have, the easier it is for people to find us. And please tell a friend about the podcast, especially if they love Bruce or music, because it will make a difference. You just heard the fun talking, hard rocking, music loving, album ranking, 
fan thinking, joy spreading, lyric reading, story sharing podcast that is the one, the only, Set Listening Bruce. The theme for Set Listening Bruce was written by David Rosen, used by permission.